Good afternoon and happy Wednesday, everybody. This is Tony, the Geek Agent from here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, specifically out in the southeast corner in Pembroke, Ontario, Canada, a little 5,000 home subdivision of Hamilton. I appreciate y'all joining me today. We are going to be chatting with a good friend and colleague of mine, Keith Roy from Remax in Vancouver, BC. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of different topics. Uh, Keith is an internationally known and respected speaker and trainer and coach. Uh, in the real estate market. He works uh, with Richard Robbins and he has his own real estate team in Vancouver, BC. He has been one of the top real estate uh, agents and real estate teams in Vancouver for the better part of nine or 10 years now. Um, lifelong, uh, born in, in British Columbia, born in Vancouver, lived in British Columbia, actually went to school here in Ontario for a little while. So he's actually very familiar with the Toronto market, the GTA, and he's out here working with Remax quite a bit as well. So we're going to get his view on what's happening in Vancouver. There's a lot of things going on there. Usually it seems like whatever happens in the Vancouver market, it takes about a year or so, and then the governments kind of implement whatever happened in BC to here in Toronto and try. Because the housing markets, although the areas themselves are very different, uh, the housing markets have similar challenges. So the, they're trying to do a number of different things. So the foreign buyer tax or the non-resident tax that we're familiar with here now in Ontario actually was implemented in BC about, a, about 18 months prior to it happening here in Ontario. And now some of the other changes that are happening there, specifically as realtors are concerned with things like dual agency and restrictions on dual agency are already being implemented in British Columbia and are on their way here to Ontario as well. So we're going to get Keith's take on all these different topics. We're going to have a big chat. A whole bunch of people joined in already. I really appreciate y'all being here. Please feel free to share the feed onto your own pages and out to your groups on Facebook. And hopefully we'll get a good conversation going here. So without further ado, I am just going to unmute my friend Keith there so you can actually hear him. And so there you go. Uh, so anyways, we'll, we'll continue on. So you're out there in Vancouver. You've been there for just uh, over 12 years now. Um, yep. And you've obviously seen a lot of changes happening there. Um, and oh, just trying to, somebody's trying to call me on Skype and he probably should stop. <laughs> so um, so you've seen a lot of changes there, obviously. In the last probably three to four years have been a lot of upheaval out there, mainly due to the the lack of supply of housing, the demand for housing, competitions happening, and rapid increases in housing prices, right? Um, we're, we're experiencing the similar type of thing here. What's the sort of, I guess, I mean, you're, you're frequently on the local media broadcasts on CBC and global news. Um, what is the feeling out there, like as far as the media coverage that realtors are getting, uh, the housing market in general? What are you hearing from people out there? Yeah, I'll set the stage for you. For those of you who aren't familiar with Vancouver, we have mountains on the north, we have a border on the south, we have an ocean on the west, and we have mountains in the east. And 70% of the lower mainland, that greater Vancouver area, is tied up as farmland, and it's protected farmland. So we have a very limited amount of land supply, unlike the GTA, which can just keep going further and further north into the 905 and the right. 519. And so what that's resulted in is skyrocketing prices. We also have an enormous amount of influence and money coming in from mainland China. Um, most of it, or a lot of it funneled through Hong Kong, but mainland China. And we don't have the zoning policies that allow the density that you would get in places like downtown Toronto. Right. Outside of the core of Vancouver, I live in a house, uh, just like a, a regular house, but I'm less than 15 minutes from the core of the city. That's, right. that's not enough density for the volume of people we have coming in. So prices have gone up dramatically, like mm -hmm. dramatically. The average price of a house, um, and I wanted to get you the exact number, the average sure. price of a house on the west side of Vancouver last month was $3.2 million. Mm -hmm. And that's not a that's not a special house. That's literally an average house. That might right. be a four thousand square foot lot with a twenty five hundred square foot bungalow. Right. And that's three point two mil. And that's what we that's what kind of gave me the idea to give you a shout and try to get you on to kind of have the discussion. Uh, specifically, you were quoted in the New York Times. Congratulations. <laughs> you're, you're, yeah, big, you're, big accomplishment. You're now a world famous quote in the New York Times about basically exactly what you just said about living uh, 10 to 15 minutes from downtown core in a detached house. And, and other comments throughout the article from various people like economists at the universities there uh, basically raise that same point is that 
you're in a in an area where a lot of people want to live, but you're stuck with these single detached homes, essentially urban sprawl. I mean, that's kind of what we're fighting against for a lot of the time. Um, instead of, like you mentioned, like either townhouses or low to mid-rise or even high-rise condominium buildings that you see in a lot of internationally desirable cities like Manhattan and London and all these major cities in all these countries that become a magnet for not only foreign investment, but just even people within your own country. They, everybody wants to move to where the jobs are. Um, so they want to move downtown and stuff like that. So what are some of the other factors in Vancouver? Obviously, you've got the ocean nearby and all yeah. that sort of stuff. So what are the, the, the things that really attract people to want to live in Vancouver and be right where the action is downtown? Um, arguably, we have the most mild climate in Canada. Uh, yeah. There's there's pockets of Vancouver Island that are better. And I know Tony Joe's watching right now. And yeah. He would say that they have a better climate. But Vancouver, as as far as the Canadian city goes, we have a we have a phenomenal client climate. Um, we have mild winters for the most part. We have a fair bit of rain. Our summers tend to be unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, access to the beach, boating, hiking. I I liken it to this: if you live in Winnipeg, uh, when winter comes around, you probably got to go away in October to get a heat get some heat, go away in January, and then maybe you got to go away again in March before you can get out to, you know, Lake of the Woods or, you know, Falcon Lake or wherever mm-hmm. you're going to the, the cottage. Whereas in British Columbia or in Vancouver, you don't have to you don't have to go anywhere to warm up. You don't have to right. take those winter vacations. You can you can go to Whistler and go skiing. Later that later that same day you could come down and play around a golf at Furry Creek Golf Course, which is where uh, Adam Sandler beat up uh, Bob Barker in <laughs> in Happy in Gilmore. Happy Gilmore yeah. Right. So you can you can do all of this on the same day in Vancouver, and that's going to attract a lot of people from around the world. It's safe. It's clean. Mm-hmm. It's got a good climate. It's it's got it's got a good food scene. Yeah. Um, there's lots going on here, right? Yeah, it's a truly international city. And then just mentioning like Happy Gilmore, it's one of the funny refer- funnier references. But there's a bustling uh, film industry out there in, in British Columbia in general for TV and movie production, which is, again, very similar to what's happening in Toronto. And even just here in Hamilton, we're about 45 minutes out from Toronto. But the, the number of film productions happening here um, is just enormous compared to most cities around Canada. So film and TV productions bring a lot of investment to the cities um, and bring in a lot of international recognition because the most recently the uh, one of the Best Picture Award winners, uh, Shape of Water, was filmed here. And the director, Guillermo del Toro, is a huge fan of Hamilton. So he's on his Twitter account talking about it. So we're getting a lot of, like Vancouver, like Toronto, we're getting mentioned in the New York Times. We're getting... You know, just as one of the places that people want to live. So the question becomes, I guess, is how do we handle um, this influx of people? Like, I think we've just had discussions briefly just before the show. In the GTA, we're expecting an influx of about 16 million people or so over the next 20 years. So that's like five times the city of Toronto just dumped on the GTA area, which is anywhere from Niagara all the way up to Peterborough and Oshawa. Um, So what kind of things do you think that, you know, city planners, governments need to do to kind of sort of address these issues of, you know, housing supply and competition for prices, or is is there something that we can do? Yeah, uh, so as you know, and I'm going to do a shameless plug here, I host oh, yeah. a podcast called the Vancouver on Real Estate Show, yeah. and over the course of 50, 60 episodes, I've interviewed people uh, all about the housing issue in Vancouver, the real estate market around the world. And I've determined that there's two very firm camps. There's supply-siders and demand-siders. Mm-hmm. There's an academic group, kind of the ivory tower crowd, that thinks that we should curb demand, stop the mm-hmm. foreign buyers, stop uh, what they claim is almost exclusively money laundering, and mm-hmm. uh, they throw out words like speculation. Um, they want to go after that. And then the other camp is the supply-siders, where we just need to build more supply, we need to make more product available. And I've come to the conclusion that there's a there's actually a fine balance in the middle where we need to dictate the, the right supply to accommodate the demand that's going to happen regardless of what we do. Right. And so we're building a lot of luxury one-bedroom condos, and that's working for the market because they're getting bought up and the developers are doing fine, mm-hmm. but we need to dictate some of the types of homes that we build and at the same time the demand side those young families you know two kids young couple they need to change their attitude about what they're going to get into 
uh, one of the suburbs of Vancouver here is Coquitlam, and I interviewed the mayor, and one of the things Coquitlam's doing is if a developer builds a third bedroom in an apartment, they're in that like 10 by 10 room, that third bedroom, as additional bonus density without having to pay for it. And right. it's going over and above typical zoning. So now mm -hmm. developers are incentivized to build that three bedroom, which can then be sold to the market and rented out to the family that wants to stay in the city or sold in a way that because the costs have been brought down on it, it's been sold in a way that the family might even be able to afford to buy it. But they, you just can't live in a house in a city on a regular salary. It, it's just not going to happen. People, mm -hmm. I said to you before, right, people don't expect to own a home, like if I grew up in New York, I wouldn't feel it was my birthright to own a, a home in Manhattan. I just wouldn't no. feel that way, that's the reality. My sister just moved back from London. Her and her husband lived in London for five years. And I, I said, did you ever feel like, and he's a Brit, I said, did either of you ever feel like you had the right to own a home in London? No. And yeah. home, home ownership is not a right, but housing in a country as advanced as Canada is a right. For sure. And we, we should be responsible for providing shelter to our fellow citizens, you know, good quality shelter. But I yeah. don't think that home ownership is a right for everyone in Canada. And mixing those two arguments has created a lot of problems and, and mm -hmm. stalled the zoning development uh, process. Exactly. And I think that's part, yeah, exactly. That's part of the issue as well is that you, you sort of conflate the two between home, home shelter and, and ownership kind of thing. Um, and I think the big thing is too is that there there seems to be in, in not everybody I talk to most people seem to understand that you know if you if you can't afford to buy a house in a certain area then you've just got to look into a different area and really that's it so if you really if your end goal is to live in a detached home you've got to go to an area where you can afford to buy a detached home and that's not always going to be in the same place where you grew up. Um, and I think there's, again, different camps involved always, and there's always talk of things like gentrification, um, which gets applied, applied pretty broadly across um, things that are happening in the U.S. where you've got these really poor neighborhoods and they're building like these luxury towers that remain empty in the middle of like what is essentially a, a, an older declining neighborhood versus things like people who are moving into older neighborhoods and just sort of fixing up a house and selling it for market value kind of thing. So they sort of get all painted with the same brush, even though they're sort of, they have different impacts on their cities. But I think most people seem to understand that, you know, especially here in, in being as close as we are to Toronto, we get a lot of people, or at least I do, that move from Toronto to Hamilton because they can't afford to live in downtown Toronto. Like the average price, like we were discussing before, I mean, it's much higher there in West Vancouver at 3.2 million. But in downtown Toronto, the average price is still around 900,000 to a million dollars for a very sort of, you know, 40, 50 year old little two, three bedroom home in downtown Toronto, nothing special. And it's almost a million dollars. Whereas you move 45 minutes down the road to Hamilton and that average price is now $500,000. And you move a little bit further out to Niagara Falls, and it's three or 350. So there's their housing options are available, uh, but they're not always going to be in the most, you know, the place where everybody wants to be. Everybody would love to be like near Times Square, and, and you'd be able to walk downtown and, and have a house there. But that's just not the reality, really. Yeah, my, my mom grew up in Vancouver, uh, moved out from Northern Ontario when she was quite young and was raised here in Vancouver. And I we lived all around British Columbia and then we, it ended with high school. We lived in a suburb of Vancouver. Uh, my mm. mom grew up in Vancouver, so arguably I have a birthright to Vancouver. I was born sure. at the Vancouver General Hospital, but that's not a birthright just because you were born somewhere. My mom had to mm. leave and go to the suburbs. And we wanted a yeah. house and a different life. We lived in Prince George. We lived in Powell River. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's tough. I, and and I feel for people because I stand in open houses every weekend, as I'm sure mm -hmm. you do periodically as well. And you see the the turmoil that buyers are going through and the frustration of mm -hmm. affordability and the size of the space. Like I get it. I don't want to sound heartless, but mm -hmm. uh, a change in expectations on the part of the consumer and a recognition mm -hmm. that. Maybe, and I got this advice on, on one of our podcast interviews, if you want to own something, you could own something where you could afford it, maybe that's two or three suburbs out, you could rent that out, and you could choose to rent where you want to live in the urban center, 
So at mm-hmm. least you've got a, a foothold in the market, you're building some equity, you're paying down a loan over time, you're leveraging you know, all the economic opportunities that the country has. Mm-hmm. So it, it doesn't have to be, I want to own a home in Vancouver, I can't afford it, therefore I'm upset. You can, you can mm-hmm. change your lifestyle, make some sacrifices. Home ownership is always going to be a sacrifice, it's always been a sacrifice. It means mm-hmm. you spend your weekend at the Home Depot getting things for your home, it means you don't get to go out for dinner as much as you used to. It yeah. means that when you go away, it's a little more uh, practice and worry you know, to make sure that you turn your taps mm-hmm. off in case there's damage. There's extra bills every month. But there sure. is value to home ownership. You as a realtor know it. I know it. Most people who own a home know it. Yeah. Uh, but it's just not a right. It's, it's a sacrifice mm-hmm. and a privilege. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, and at least half my family, my dad's side of the family, immigrated here in the '60s from Italy. Uh, my mom's side had already been established here for a few generations, but um, and they sort of went through the same thing because a lot of them landed in Toronto and then just realized that you know we need to purchase a home. And even back then, it wasn't as affordable in Toronto as it is in Hamilton or London or Guelph or that sort of thing. So they radiated out from the GTA to find a place where they could put down roots, where they could own a home and they could you know, be part of the community and help build that community as homeowners. Um, so that's nothing, it's nothing really new. I think it's been intensified because I think Canada is growing. I think we, we've, we are taking our place on the international stage more and more in places like Toronto and Vancouver, which might have been a little bit more on the sleepy side, I guess, internationally, maybe a couple decades ago, have really risen to become like a truly international cities, right? Like yeah. with all the sports teams that are, you know, getting a lot of international recognition and even just music artists and just as places to live as the same thing is happening in these other places like London and Hong Kong, where the prices there are even going even crazier than they are here. Um, so now we become an even more attractive option. So it just puts that much more pressure on it. Hey, look, Bar- um, Barack Obama never used to talk about Canada, and now it's all Donald Trump talks about. So we're, yeah. <laughs> He's we're a big deal. <laughs> absolutely. Maybe not in the best way, but we are absolutely on the radar now. There's no so such there thing go. as bad press. We'll be fine. Oh, yeah, there you go. Um, so what are the solutions then? I mean, like again, the only other thing I can kind of think of, like you're talking about allowing for expansion onto basement suites and stuff like that. And we are starting to see in some areas here in Hamilton where developers have come in and actually purchased entire blocks. So they'll come in and they're they're taking like really old homes that are probably in the 80-year range that are just haven't been well-maintained um, for various reasons. And they're actually taking them down and they're actually increasing the, the density by replacing them with uh, properly constructed townhomes, uh, sometimes stacked townhomes, sort of almost like the New York brownstone type model, that kind of thing. But we are getting closer to uh, doing that kind of thing here in Hamilton and in Toronto, because as you mentioned, like a, a friend of mine was just in Chicago showing some photos from a rooftop in Chicago and there's nothing but high rises downtown. And when you take a walk down through New York, again, it's it's just apartments on top of apartments and these old sort of brownstone neighborhoods and stuff to increase the density. So what's the feasibility of something like that? Because I know we've talked and I know, you know, just mentioning a condo project in Hamilton is still kind of taboo. Like people still seem yeah. to kind of like the not in my backyard kind of thing mentality. And it's like, what's the feeling in Vancouver around that sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, NIMBYism is a big part, right? The not in my backyard sure. people are, they're everywhere because nobody likes change. It's difficult and challenging and it ruins your quality. And you want your kids to have the exact same experience in childhood that you did because you remember all the good parts of your childhood. Sure. Uh, Vancouver is going through a land rush right now where the city through what I would argue has been really poor planning has been creating, has been spot rezoning. Um, they've taken right. some neighborhoods and redone community plans and they've decided, okay, you're a millionaire, you're a multimillionaire, you're a multimillionaire, you're the fourth house in from a main street, you're screwed. Because Mm -hmm. the first three houses are rezoned to a six-story condo, but you have to stay as a house. And so now you've got a six-story tower next to a house. That house just became worthless. And the one lot over, part of a three-lot land assembly, just just sold for two or three times assessed value. Right. Um, I think hmm. Vancouver needs um, across the board rezoning. We need to go back to almost zero based zoning, where if we just we just looked at the city and said, okay, 
if there was no zoning restrictions in place with what we have now, what would we do? Where would we create an industrial park? Where would we put high density housing? Where would we put medium and then low density housing? Where would we put transit? Where would we put infrastructure? But we're kind of working off this patchwork and we're just mm. spot rezoning neighborhoods. And it's, it's mostly because we have very strong community groups in Vancouver uh, that push mm. back really hard. Everyone, everyone believes in affordable housing in Vancouver until the city puts in modular temporary housing for the homeless population. If you put that in my neighborhood, I don't believe in, I, I don't believe in helping poor people. But if you, is is what they're saying. But if you, right. but, but but if you ask them, do you think that we should put more effort into housing homeless people? They'll invariably say yes because that's the right thing to say. Just nobody sure. wants it in their backyard, and we just need yes. to. So Vancouver has, um, unlike uh, Toronto, we don't have a ward system. We have right. a citywide system of civic governance. So all of our city councilors are elected citywide, which is good, and it gives us it'll give us an opportunity going forward to come up mm -hmm. with a strategy that is citywide. But the city hasn't been doing a great job, I would say, over the last ten years. They've done neat things in some neighborhoods. But that's resulted in this crazy land rush. And for anybody who comes to Vancouver this summer on vacation, you'll get out of the airport, you'll drive down the street, and you will see for sale signs on every major street, like 10, 15 houses in a row, all have an individual for sale sign on them, and they're all part right. of a land assembly. Right. Yeah, so there's lots of changes going. I mean, if you're looking around the world, too, you're looking at like places like Boston and Pittsburgh and stuff, they've kind of undertaken a lot of these sort of really huge projects really to sort of get things uh you know like you said kind of looking back and trying to correct the mistakes of the past i guess right like you know we if, if we had could go back in time and replan this city from the beginning as you mentioned what would we have done kind of and sort of now it becomes a, the job of fixing it which is more expensive and more time consuming and laborious than if we had the chance to do it right from the beginning but it's something that at some point probably needs to be done to get things working properly um, so I'm switching gears a little bit now, like, there's also a lot of changes coming to the realtor profession in general out in BC, which is, again, we're sort of in that like, year to year and a half lag behind whatever's happening in BC. So just this coming Friday, there's a lot of changes coming to dual agency. Um, what's happening exactly in BC and how are the rules changing there? Yeah, so everything British Columbia does, uh, Ontario does about a year and a half later. Yeah. <laughs> um, we brought in a foreign buyer tax. Ontario brought in a foreign buyer tax. We elected an old white guy as our premier. You elected an old white guy as your premier. Yeah. Different ends of the political spectrum. Still, but, yeah. it, it's the resurgence. I was I was telling Stephanie the other day. Uh, Doug Ford is the resurgence. You know, the, the further manifestation of the resurgence of the old white guy being in power. Yeah. I mean, Donald Trump, Justin Trudeau. Uh, Doug Ford, John Horrigan, uh, for a while there, it had it had all shifted to being diverse and exciting and interesting, and old yeah. white guys are back in power everywhere. A bit of a knee jerk, yeah. Yeah, and it it, it bodes well for any political future I have because at some point I'm going to be an old white guy. Because you'll be an old white guy. Yes. But <laughs> we are lacking some diversity on all levels of government right now. Um, yeah. But to your question of dual agency in British Columbia, what's happening is. Uh, there was some uh, arguably bad behavior by some realtors in British Columbia over the course of the last number of years while prices were going up dramatically. And what happened was a, it was a term that the Globe and Mail coined shadow flipping, where people would, uh, a realtor with a buyer would approach a seller, offer to buy the home, they'd buy it. And then before the home had completed, they'd paid the money, they'd already taken that contract and sold it to another party for increased profit. And yeah. That wasn't hard to do when you had six and nine month closings because the market was accelerating it. You know, if it's mm -hmm. going twelve percent a year, that's one percent a month. Six months you can you can flip it for six percent. And our commissions are cheaper here, so six percent uh, is is still doable even after you've made the sale. But these sales sure. are happening two, three times in some cases, and the original owner um, wasn't getting the profit. And mm -hmm. but the buyer had taken on risk. So the province ended that practice, and the uh, practice of assigning contracts was no longer allowed. The follow-up mm -hmm. to that was a full frontal attack on the real estate industry. Um, 
probably deservedly so. Um, organized real estate in British Columbia didn't do a great job of, of presenting or defending itself. Uh, but mm-hmm. what the province did was they took away self-regulation. So realtors were right. self a uh, self-regulating body, uh, mm-hmm. like the College of Nurses and those kind of as prof- we are here in Ontario. Yeah, too. professional yeah. organizations. They took that mm-hmm. away. The council, the real estate council, is now run by the province with um, a superintendent of real estate, who is appointed by the provincial government, and mm-hmm. they've come up with a bunch of new rules. Uh, one of which is ending dual agency. That's the most public one. Uh, so, whereas today um, we're Wednesday the the 13th right now, if mm-hmm. I if I'm representing a seller and a buyer walks into the home and says I'd like to buy the home, I ask the question, do you have a realtor? They say no. Uh, I say um, and they say I want to buy the home. And I if I were to help them, I can help them one of two ways. I can they can be an unrepresented party and then I can do the paperwork, mm-hmm. represent the seller, put the deal together. Or alternatively, I can do what's called limited dual agency, which most people are familiar with, where I represent both the buyer and the seller, and I exclude myself from any conflicting situations, namely price and strategic advice. But Mm -hmm. I act fair for all parties, and I just help sell the home. Buyer's choice, seller's informed, everybody's good, deal's done, realtor gets both sides of the commission because realtor does both sides of the deal. Mm -hmm. That's ending. So as of Friday... I will no longer be able to represent the buyer. I will, however, still be able to conduct the transaction representing the seller, but I would Mm -hmm. only be able to do so if the buyer was informed that they were an unrepresented party and they had risks as an unrepresented party. So Mm -hmm. it's not really ending the ability to double end from a realtor standpoint. It's just ending the ability to represent both sides. Right. the more interesting consequence of that is the concept of implied agency has been thrown around British Columbia. Mm-hmm. And uh, if I'm standing, I'll give an extreme example. If I'm in an open house and someone walks in and says, I really like this house, I'd like to buy it. Okay, mm-hmm. do you have a realtor? No, I don't. I want to use you. You can't use me. I can't help you. Well, I just won the lottery. Um, my, my grandmother passed away and I, I've got all this money and my landlord kicked me out and I have to move into this home. Um, you're going to be my agent and help me. There's an argument to be made there that I've got personal information about that buyer and now sure. we are in an implied agency situation. Mm-hmm. And the, the legislation that came there, the rules that came down from the council say that I now have to opt out of this deal, opt out of the right. seller and the buyer because right. I... I'm, I'm in an implied agency situation with someone who I've never met until now, and I'm mm-hmm. in an actual agency relationship with the person who hired me, um, right. and I have to opt out unless I can convince both parties to sign a conflict situation that I've agreed to, that they've agreed that I'm in conflict and I'm only going to represent one of the two parties. Right. Now, this goes retroactive. So if someone walks in with their own realtor and wants to buy one of my listings, realtor, um, Buyer comes mm-hmm. in, they have their own realtor, they're with their realtor. That buyer also happens to have been a client of mine 10 years ago. And for whatever reason, we had right. a thing out, it didn't work. Um, they've now hired their own representation. I'm still in a conflicted situation. Mm-hmm. And I have to tell my seller to sign a piece of paper to allow me out of the conflict. But then I have to convince the buyer through their realtor to sign me out of the conflict. Now, Here's what's right. going to happen. That buyer is going to say, I don't want to sign him out. He's a great realtor. I want to screw the seller. So then the seller is right. unrepresented because I'm going to have to fire them. And then that person with their new realtor can go in and buy the home. So right. it's it's an attack on consumer choice. And I, I get the idea of ending dual agency and there was some bad behavior going on there. But the the unintended consequences of the attack on consumer choice are going to be problematic. It's going to be interesting. There's a lot of chatter on the BC Realtor channels about how are you doing open houses this weekend? What are you going to say to people? Um, mm-hmm. If you phone me off of a, uh, a sign you saw that of a house I've got for sale, I can answer factual information about the home. If you ask mm-hmm. me anything strategic, you say, well, what do you think is going to happen with the neighborhood in the future? I, I have to stop the conversation, get mm-hmm. your email address, and send you, I think it's a four, it's a three-page form. But they're not out yet. Right. I've only seen drafts. I have to send you a three-page form, keep a record that I've sent it to you, ask you to sign it, but you don't have to sign it, and then I can phone you back and I can answer your questions. And that's, yeah. 
That's awesome. <laughs> I don't even know how that works in a practical sense. I mean, at this point... It's it's starting on Friday. The forms haven't been released yet. Uh, Again, we've only seen a draft version. Uh, Sure. It's it's great. It's going to go from being the Wild West to the very tightly controlled... It's even beyond tightly controlled, though. But like you said, as far as consumer choice is concerned, I'm not sure how that works. Because um, a lot of of people don't stick with the same realtor for their lifetime. Um, like we can see the stats from from the board stats and everything like that. That you know, I have a lot of repeat clients from the past and stuff. But there are there have been ones that for you know for no reason at all, just kind of we lost touch or whatever, and they've gone off, or they've had a friend refer who's become a realtor in the meantime, or they've referred to somebody, and now if they show up to purchase a house, they can tell the seller or force the seller to end their contract with me. Um, because they don't want to release me from something. That just seems weird to me. Or or um, your, your buyer now can't buy their home because you're in a conflicted situation. It works on right. both sides. Yeah, it's kind of weird. And I just had the similar, like I was, ref- I get, you know, as you do, I'm sure in Vancouver and here in Hamilton, I do get a lot of referrals from realtors from across the country uh, for because we just happen to live in areas where people are moving to. Um, so they're moving to Toronto, they're moving to Hamilton, they're coming from Ottawa and Oshawa and all those places. And um, so I had just recently, actually, I had a house listed on the Hamilton Mountain that I was selling for a couple. Um, I had a referral from Ottawa that I was just basically acting as a tour guide almost because the Ottawa agent actually wanted to come and do the transaction with the clients for whatever reason. But we were looking over in Ancaster. I know you're kind of familiar with the area. So I was on Hamilton Mountain with my listing and I was showing them houses in Ancaster, which is where they wanted to live. But at some point they really couldn't find what they wanted in Ancaster. So on their own, they expanded their search, saw the property that I had listed and, and gave it to me as part of a list of about five or six homes that they wanted to see and ended up wanting to buy that home. Um, so at that point, the Ottawa realtor was going to... Uh, represent them in, in the purchase of the home. And that's still allowed here. Even multiple representation is still for the time being allowed here in Ontario. But we already had the agreement that the Ottawa realtor was going to represent them. Um, knowing that this was the house I listed, I was very careful to to not disclose any information from my sellers and that. But at the same time, I had already been working with the buyers for, you know, a couple months now. So yeah. um, it just, you know, it, it's kind of a weird situation to not allow me to continue to help them if they trust me and they're comfortable with me and the sellers are also comfortable with me to suddenly say, no, no, it's just, just, just a, isn't allowed. Um, it's just a weird situation in my mind. Like I said, I yeah. think real estate But it, is, goes, it goes even further. You would have to fire sure. your seller if you couldn't get everybody yeah. to agree. Yeah. So after, you know, investing whatever it was, I invested to list the property and all that sort of stuff. And the month's worth of work, you know, whatever it was to get this property sold kind of goes out the window at that point. Um, Or you have to start building in things to the listing contract that, you know, if that situation arises, then the seller is going to have to compensate you somehow for the money that you spent. Even like, I don't understand. Well, I think, I think trying to wrap my head around. Yeah. Once, once we get into it, I think we might move to a situation where there's a marketing, an upfront marketing fee involved. Uh, You know, there might be a a, a $2,000 a $2,500 upfront marketing fee to list your home. And then that would, you know, that's reduced off of a typical amount of commission at the end. Um, because because you're right there's there's a bunch of challenges that that are being presented by this we don't know it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out i don't think it's going to be as bad or as dramatic as people think no. it is and i give you some yeah. extreme examples uh sure. but those are realistic scenarios that have been presented by the real estate council and we've otherwise been unable to come up with any sort of clarity on how to do business practices yeah and, and i think course, it just depends on the realtor right i think like for myself i don't a large portion of my business is not represented by multiple offer representation that kind no, of thing. No, but here's I've, here's I've, who it hurts. But some do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is this is interesting problem for neighborhood experts. So if you are the right. neighborhood expert and buyers come to you because you have advanced notice of property and buyers come to you for information, you're the most informed person in your neighborhood, that is mm-hmm. now a liability. And you yeah. need to pick, are you going to work with sellers in your neighborhood or buyers in your neighborhood? Because you, you, if you've got a, you know, a 15 to 20, 30% market share in mm-hmm. one neighborhood, you're, you're now a liability because your buyers effectively can't buy your listings without additional disclosures and additional agreement. Right. And why would any buyer, even with their own realtor, want to go up against 
the neighborhood expert. They're never going to yeah. let the neighborhood expert be involved in that transaction. Yeah, and the uh, buyers, the buyer's desire to own the home trumps the realtor's contract to get yeah. paid if it sells. Yeah, and you could see that the buyer's realtor, the, their representative working in their best interest, would probably advise them and say, no, this this guy or girl is the top agent in the area. They're a really tough negotiator. If we could take them out of the equation, it would benefit you as a buyer. So I think that's what we should do. Yeah. And and if you're working in, like, you know, you have fiduciary duty to your buyer to advise them in their best interest, that's a perfectly legitimate thing to tell them, I think. Yeah. Right? Uh, it's interesting. Nothing, yeah. nothing, nothing is constant but change, right? Yeah. That's that's what we always say. Or the uh, the blessing and the curse, like may you live in interesting times. Yeah, so that sort of thing. So aside, let's go sort of take us outside of that now. So aside from real estate and buying and selling real estate, yeah, you're also also an internationally renowned speaker and trainer and coach, or so I am told. So I'm just. <laughs> I know you work with Richard Robbins International, and you also have your own sort of coaching and training. Um, what type of things have you, have you been encountering? I know just recently, uh, I think Turkey was your last sort of big trip as yeah. far as speaking goes, but you've been around the world, really. So what sort of things are you involved in outside of just buying and selling real estate? Yeah, so over the course of my career, I've done a lot of, um, I've, te- I've attended a lot of Richard Robbins conferences and training. and. Um, I would credit a, a large part of my depth of knowledge as having, as a result of having been coached by that organization, and for a number of years by Rich himself. And over that time, Rich had me up on stage every once in a while to speak at his events and share some of my practices. Uh, brokers in the audience saw me, agents in the audience saw me. Like, oh, we really like that. Can he come to our office? So that had me out mm-hmm. in Toronto a couple times. It had me down in Minneapolis, and I'm bouncing around doing some stuff, and then. Remax picks up on this. They like some of the content, and Remax International is always looking for that kind of greater depth of knowledge. And I had the opportunity to uh, speak for Remax of Chile last year, and then this year uh, I went down and spoke at Remax Argentina. Last month I was in Remax in Turkey. And what's been interesting around the world is the Canadian real estate in uh, organized, you know, organized real estate in Canada is the most advanced in the world. It's very fragmented in the United States, right? The, Zillow is the one site you go to to look at everything in the States. Right. But Zillow is not organized real estate. Zillow is a private company. Right. Realtor.ca is the envy of consumers around the world. And most of these countries uh, are just completely unregulated. There's no licensing. Uh, in Argentina, they don't license realtors, but they license brokers. In Chile, it's the Wild West. Like, I got up on stage in Chile, and my first line was, I'm Keith, I'm a realtor here in Chile. And you just say you're a realtor, and there you go. Turkey, same thing. Uh, Most of Europe is like that. Um, By the time a country is regulating its realtors, particularly the depth of the Canadian real estate industry, like in British Columbia, we're very heavily regulated. By the Mm -hmm. time a country is regulating its realtors, it has solved most other social problems. You've got right. clean water, you've got good health care, people are safe, tax collection is easy, and then they're like, okay, you know what, let's go regulate the, the smallest of the industries we can find right. <laughs> really aggressively. Um, but I've learned some fascinating things around the world. In Argentina, I was touring the Remax headquarters and it's own, the region is owned by Sebastian and Dottie Sosa, and okay. we're going through their headquarters and I'm, I used to work at a restaurant, and I, I look over, and we pass an office, and I, I come back, and he's like, what are you looking at? I was like, is, is that a cash machine? And he's like, mm-hmm. yeah, we do a lot of our transactions in cash. I'm like, but you do them in the yeah. real estate office? And people come into the office with wads of cash, and they just run it through yep. the cash counter. And yep. same, same thing in Turkey. In Turkey, at the, they have like a land titles office. People will show up with duffel bags of cash at the land titles office. He, yep. And the broker I was talking to there, he said, you can go sit on the stairs there and watch. People show up with like a, a grocery bag, like a like a plastic grocery bag full of cash at the land titles office just to do a transaction. And somehow yep. no one's getting mugged at these places. I don't know how that's happening. Yeah. I do. I did see something like that a few years ago now. And it was one of, on one of these shows like House Hunters International or something along those. But you mentioning that just kind of triggered that to me. I think it was like in Estonia or something like that. But same idea. They had to show up at the office with like just a, a huge chunk, like $100,000 or $200,000 in cash. 
Yeah. But in, in that country, though, they were very afraid of being mugged and being uh, and being and have and because people knew that this was happening, so these sort of gangs and whatnot, or organized crime or whatever it was, would be waiting for yeah. the people to show up because they know that you know if they're carrying a little bit of a bigger bag, they probably got a wad of money because they're going into what looks like a real estate office. But again, the, there's no regulation whatsoever, and cooperation, like cooperating brokerages, paying like a buyer's agent, is sort of unheard of in in most of these countries or referral fees the kind of things that we sort of as as professional real estate agents in Canada realtors in Canada is sort of second nature to us it well, just doesn't exist consumers in Canada um, for all the hatred for realtors these days and all the venom that's spewed about realtors realtors built this unbelievable system in Canada where we have most of the sales happening on one website we keep all the data and we provide that data to our clients so that they can make really well informed decisions the closest mm-hmm. thing you have to an MLS in most of these countries around the world is the Remax website because Remax is the dominant brand, so they do the mm-hmm. most transactions, and they keep track of their data. But you don't know what Coldwell Banker sold their listing for, and you don't know what the Century 21 listing sold for. So mm-hmm. you just don't know what true market value is. And right. and there's in a lot of these countries, reporting is so poor, uh, like in Argentina, some of the transactions there's a there's the posted price but then there's mm-hmm. the real price and someone might pay you know a couple hundred thousand argentinian pesos or whatever it is but then they'll yeah. also pay you $250,000 american mm-hmm. wired from an american account to an american account right mm-hmm. and so there's multiple levels of compensation right. for the transaction Right, um, and, and none of it's tracked very well. <laughs> and it's reported to the government as a low amount because you have to pay tax on the you don't pay tax transaction. Well. Sure, right? so essentially, now, essentially offshore accounts. <laughs> yeah, but, but there's ways around the world that make me think how complicated we've made it in North America. I mean, my mm-hmm. my standard kind of sales contract here is about six pages in Vancouver with disclosures. It's turning into about twelve or fifteen, depending on how well mm-hmm. I know the buyer and all the new stuff with agency. Mm-hmm. But you go to a place like South America, from the time I look at your home to the time I could own it, it could be two or three days. Mm-hmm. We could go through a transaction in no time, and it's totally secure, and it works fine, and there's title, and we transfer the money, and off we go. Mm-hmm. So in some ways, we've overcomplicated it. Right. In other ways, we've got a lot of we've got a lot of great protections in place for consumers and sure. people in Canada should be thankful for the quality of real estate information and data that they have they shouldn't mm-hmm. be angry at realtors for creating it they should be thankful to realtors for building something so wonderful and i wish treb would have done a better job of protecting our data with the competition mm-hmm. bureau and explaining that we built it we own it it's not a public good but we've made it a public good and there's a cost associated with it because right. realtors have done a wonderful service to consumers in Canada by building a system where consumers know how every tran- – like to the day, not when it closes at land titles. We've built like the three-month lag time. We've mm-hmm. built this system of phenomenal data that makes consumers better informed. They can track the market. They can make more informed decisions. We've saved, we've saved and earned people millions of dollars by building mm-hmm. such a great system. And we shouldn't we shouldn't give it up. We shouldn't have to give it up. Um, mm-hmm. Should be proud of what we've done as realtors in Canada because we have an unbelievable re- or- system of organized real estate here. Yeah, and I, 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 I I'm hard pressed to find another industry that's under pressure to give up their proprietary information and make it public. It's just to me, it just seems like a no brainer almost. Yeah. Um, but you know, there, again, with that issue, there's camps, right? Um, so, I mean, not to dive into the Zillow discussion too much because that is a whole other week long discussion, it seems like. Um, but they are they are present now in Canada. They're cooperating with, I think, Century 21. Yeah. Uh, they're really starting to get listings going. And the, 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 the real Zillow, thing is, is Zillow, just, I know you got a lot of realtors listening. Yeah, what absolutely. I would encourage you to do is dream a little bit. So go on Zillow, pick the place you want to live. Maybe it's Hawaii sure. or maybe you want a house in Florida. Go on Zillow and take advantage of all the algorithms and play with the searches and find what you want. Zillow is awesome. It's yeah. such a good website. They're so good at what they do. And if Absolutely. we as organized real estate had done that, there wouldn't be Zillow. But we didn't, so we're going to have to deal with it. And yeah, consumers absolutely. are better served with a website like Zillow. 
mm-hmm. than they are with Realtor.ca. Realtor.ca is clunky and slow and difficult, but the mm-hmm. information that we have developed as realtors, that backlog of data, it's so valuable that we shouldn't mm-hmm. just be giving it up. Yeah, there's a there's definitely a huge value to it. I mean, I think you were at the Inman conference in uh, January. It's where we, f- we first met in person. Yeah. Um, and I think that the overriding theme there was that data is sort of, or as oil was like the primary commodity of the last 100 years, data is the primary commodity going forward, the most valuable type commodity that pretty much any industry is going to have available to them for the next 100 years or more, right? As we move into more online work, as we move into things like artificial intelligence and augmented reality and you name it, all these different types of technology that are going to be present in virtually every industry that you can think of, the data itself and maintaining uh, accurate, reliable data is going to be extremely valuable. So it's not something that um, it's not something that I think we need to sort of protect necessarily, but I think we should realize the value of it and get fair value in return for it. If it's something that we're going to be trading, I guess, if that's yeah. the way you want to think about it. Um, so again, uh, outside of real estate, because I think we're getting close to the end now, we've been almost an hour on. Um, so what other things is happening in Keith Roy's life? I know you've done a lot of traveling. Uh, you've been out to like Hawaii recently and you just sort of, you know, just taking a scroll through your, your Facebook uh, f- f- images is kind of like just watching like a Condé Nast travel show. It's like, I've been here and I've been there and I've been there. And it's like, what's, what's next on, uh, on Keith's agenda as far as world traveling? Goes? If, if my life was half as, half as exciting as it appears on Facebook, uh, <laughs> it would be amazing. Um, what's next? We're going to take a road trip this summer and mm-hmm. we're going to drive to Toronto. Uh, I, I went to the University mm-hmm. of Guelph and I, when I went to Guelph, I used to drive back and forth across the country every year and haven't done it in a long time. Stephanie, uh, who you've had on the show, my uh, soulmate, mm-hmm. she's, she's never done that drive the whole mm-hmm. way. So we're going to go through the country, visit some friends along the way, do some hiking, um, just just see a little bit of Canada. Talk to some talk to some realtors along the way. Uh, interview some people for the podcast, uh, mm-hmm. and get to Toronto and uh, go to the wedding of a good friend in um, in the middle of August, and then work our way you know just work our way across the country and see a little bit of Canada and connect with some of those friends I've you know haven't been able to go see their markets in a long time. Cool. So that's I mean, I, we're getting ready for that. Cool. I look forward to hopefully getting the chance to meet up with you once you get to Toronto. Um, but the other thing I want to just ask you too quickly is I'm the geeky agent, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and Stephanie's in my little geeky realtor group and trying to introduce you to the ways of the force and everything else, that kind of thing. But you're a bit of a geek too. You got the Monopoly thing going on, which there's an obvious real estate connection there. But at what point or how did you get into the this obsession or this love of, of Monopoly? Yeah, I'm just going to tilt the camera here. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you look up at the top there, I've got all uh, I've got a good collection of Monopoly boards there. Um, that whole cupboard on that side is full. Uh, the cupboard down there is full. Um, I've got about 55, 60 Monopoly boards from all around the world. And I've loved the game since I was a kid. I've loved real estate since I was a kid. I used, mm-hmm. We went on a family vacation when I was 10 years old, and I picked up the real estate magazine in Florida. I'm like, look, Mom, you can buy a house on the canal in Fort Lauderdale for $300,000. <laughs> I didn't even know what that was. It just seemed like a great deal to me. It seemed like a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> and I, would, I just loved looking at these house magazines everywhere I went. And I always loved playing Monopoly. I actually never made the connection of Monopoly and real estate. And uh, what I, as I got into it, I, the first one I bought, I actually bought a Monopoly board in Israel um, in the early 2000s, I was there on a political tour, and I what I've done ever since is I've picked up a, a Monopoly board in all of the places I've been around the world. So I've got one in Cyrillic from Russia, I've got the mm. Hebrew one from Israel, I've got one from France, I've got one from England, I've got one from Germany, I've got some from South America, national parks, Disneyland, all of the Great. all of the places. Um, and it's a fun way. It's like one fun piece for me to remember the place I went, and mm. uh, it ties into real estate. It's the real estate trading game. Says it right on the cover of the yep. box. <laughs> um, and every once in a while, people will play. Um, not a lot of people will beat me. Um, I like a good, <laughs> challenging game of Monopoly. I played with my sister and Stephanie the other night, and I was in third place, made a big comeback, all within an hour. Like, within an hour, we were done. They were broke. I had hotels and houses and money. And <laughs> You're the shark. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 a lot like poker. There's a bit of chance, but there's more strategy than there is chance in a game like Monopoly. Yeah. Well, are you playing? Are you playing the actual rules, or are you playing like house rules? You we got play actual rules. rules. The, <laughs> if you play by the rules, Monopoly should be done within an hour to ninety minutes. If you play yeah. by house rules and you put money in free parking, uh, basically what you're doing there is you're adding inflationary money to the economy, and the economy just keeps going and going. But you've got rent controls, so the game never ends. Until yeah. until literally the bank is out of money, and right. everybody's got tens of thousands of dollars. There's no money in the monopoly bank, and rents are still stuck at a thousand bucks a night. Yeah. But it, yeah. the money just changed hands, and and then the bank runs out of money. That's the government. The whole thing falls apart. It's a yeah. perfect example of how the economy works. Exactly, and then you rage quit. You just throw the board up into the air. You start a fight yeah. with your bro- with your brother, and it's all good. <laughs> I, I'm French, not Italian, so. We don't, ah, we don't uh, we all go fight. there. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for being on the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, again, I do hope to see you when you guys make the trip out east. Yeah, here. we will. Uh, and we'll gra- grab dinner somewhere in Toronto. I, I sent, I think I sent Stephanie one or two pl- neat little places in downtown Toronto, which would be kind of fun, which yeah. are uh, both excellent food places and very geeky at the same time. Excellent. So there you go. So I do appreciate your insight. Uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime. And uh, as things progress, good luck in BC. I hope uh, the market's good to you and, and uh, the government's nice to you. <laughs> That's all I can really say. <laughs> Thanks, Tony, and to your audience. Thank you. Take care. Right on. Bye-bye. I'm just going to mute that here. So that was Keith Roy from Remax in Vancouver, BC. Remax finest, I believe. Uh, he's with the Keith Roy team, or Keith Roy and Associates in Vancouver, BC. He is an international, again, speaker, trainer, coach, real estate coach, uh, frequent fixture on local television on CBC and global news and all that sort of thing whenever they need someone with some real estate expertise to speak to. So I really do appreciate having him on. I appreciate you all for tuning in today and listening and having questions pop up. In the meantime, I will let you know this has been Remax Geek TV, at least my version of it. I am Tony, the geeky agent from here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, specifically in Bimbrook. I do appreciate you tuning in. If you are looking for me online, you can find me on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. I'm also on Twitter, uh, Snapchat, Pinterest, and Tumblr, but most of my contact content is on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Uh, otherwise... If you're not online, you can text or call me at 289-237-9896. I'm always free to chat or email me, tony at thegeekyagent.com, which, of course, feeds into my website, thegeekyagent.com, or hamiltonlifestylesearch.com, which will take you to the search feature at thegeekyagent.com. So again, I do appreciate you all tuning in. If you are watching this on YouTube, please feel free to find the subscribe button wherever it may be. Click on subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes of the show. And until next time, as always, I hope you have an amazing day, and I will talk to you soon. Bye for now.